Hi, I'm Jason Noriega. And I'm Megan Noriega. And we're here today to share our story about mental health. My mental health journey started when I was involved with a local nonprofit that helped severe and persistent people suffering from mental illness. When I started researching more about mental health and what that meant, I quickly learned that it affected way more people in our community than I thought. And so that fueled my fire even more as to there had to be something that I could do to increase the conversation about mental health here in our community. And so we started living with hope and mental health. So when Jason decided to provide the mental health support at Venture, it was kind of ironic timing. However, not ironic, it was God's timing. I started having panic attacks. I didn't realize that they were panic attacks at first. However, after kind of experiencing different episodes, I realized, okay, this is what's happening. I'm having a panic attack. Because I am so type A and like to be in control of everything, going through something like that was debilitating. As I got connected with a, a Christian counselor, she helped me talk through different situations and how to handle myself when I'm going through a panic attack. I remember thinking, well, what if I'm with my kids when this happens and I have to pull the car over, breathing through a panic attack, what's that gonna look like? So there was a lot of unknown and that was really scary. When I finally decided to start taking medication for it, that was a really hard step. And I thought, are my kids gonna look at me and think, why does my mom always take that medication every day? And I remember crying at the counter and Jason just talked me through it and said, we're gonna take it step by step. Day by day, step by step, and it quickly became our new normal and something that we weren't gonna be ashamed about. Community is important when you realize that you're not alone, and that's really what we're about here at Venture is everyone belongs. God created each one of us to have a unique purpose, and we're here to help you discover that. We're in this journey together, and it's one that we feel like God placed on our hearts to be the voice of those who don't have the voice, and we want Venture to be known as the church that cares. Okay, it's, all right. So thank you for that. That was really powerful. Um, so I have a series of questions that each of the panelists are going to ask. And Jason, since you had that great video, I'll start with you if you don't mind. And the first question is um, to just one second. Let me pull it. Talk a little bit about yourself and your faith tradition and how your tradition understands mental illness. First of all, thank you very much. Um, doesn't make it any easier when I watch that because that's our daily life. And just because we're involved in mental health community and advocacy and trying to help those who are struggling, when it hits so personally, it just makes it that much more real. So um, I'm a little bit of a mess after watching that. Um, I figured out that um, I'll get into that later. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Jason Noriega. I'm actually a real estate manager of a local office here in our community. Um, I got involved with mental health um, because I actually attended the great luncheon that you guys threw on um, a couple years ago. I met Kathy and I met Cindy. I am on the board of directors for Momentum for Mental Health here locally. Um, I started playing golf in their tournament when it was Alliance for Care about three years ago. I'm sorry, 13 years ago. Um, I've been on the board for about eight years now. And so we have a wonderful, wonderful partnership with the County of Santa Clara here, um, with our fabulous director, Tony Tolles, um, with the partnership of NAMI. And so um, it's been great um, getting involved with that. As you saw in the video, I have a beautiful wife, Megan, and two beautiful children, even though they're toe heads with blonde hair and blue eyes, they are mine. 
Um, they keep us on our toes, that is for sure. Um, and so, yeah, um, it, it, we're in the Christian church, non-denominational, um, and we, you know, treat mental illness as a true illness. There's no spiritual stigma with that. It really is a physiological um, illness that we acknowledge, and so. Thank you. Anyone else able, Pastor, Pastor? It's my turn. Okay. Hi, my name is Anna Nguyen. I am Catholic. I have been part of Most Holy Trinity Parish for 25 years. I became interested in mental health seven years ago, and it, it has been a humbling journey through which I come to have an appreciation for the human resilience, the mystery of life, and the strength of those who have mental illnesses and in the midst of their struggle, they and their family have to endure. I have also come to understand that the fear and the stigma toward mental illnesses as we have as a society whose productivity and um, predictability is key. We want something predictable. And with mental illnesses, you have, you know, your days that you are predictable and the days that you are not. And it's not your fault. It's not our fault in any way. Um, Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is um, Pastor Adebayo Asoba. Um, I pastor the church Jesus House Silicon Valley, uh, also known as the Redeemed Christian Church of God. It's a Pentecostal holiness, non-denominational church. Um, for me, my experience in the mental health uh, started about two, three, four years ago. Uh, I, I've been in full-time Christian ministry uh, for 25 years. I've been a pastor all my life after I graduated from college back home in Africa. I'm from Nigeria originally. And then I moved to California through divine leading of God in 2012. And I moved down to San Jose 2014. And my first experience in the mental health, even though it's something I've been doing, I didn't know it is called mental health because back home in Africa, we didn't have that label. And it's something you don't talk about. And it's something that <clears throat> is like a stigma. But my first experience was working with San Jose Behavioral Health. And I discovered that this is what I do every day as a pastor. And the people have issues, they come to Christ. And people have different kind of mental issues. But we don't call them mental issues because we feel that if we talk about it, people are going to label us. But working in this institution, San Jose Behavioral Health, National psychiatric and rehabilitation center in, in downtown San Jose and right now working with Anchor Beaver Health Institute, my eyes were open to see that we have these issues in the church and people are afraid of talking about it and especially among the young people. I see a lot of pressure that makes people and drive them into mental sicknesses and when I met Pastor Carl supernaturally through Divine Providence at Costco gas station <laughs> and he saw me, I was driving, and it's amazing how God works. I was driving, and I have a sticker at the back of my car, and then he said, um, is that a Christian church? I said, yes. Um, he said, um, then I introduced myself, he said, I'm Pastor Carl. Oh, I said, well, I'm Pastor, but he said, you're a pastor? I said, yes. I said, and he told me, oh, our church is down this way, and I said, well, our church is very close by to you too. And we got talking, and he told me, oh, we are planning a mental health um, symposium and things like that we done. I said, oh, I also work in mental health institution and that began the journey and we had a program last year. It's been fantastic and it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, you couldn't miss his you couldn't miss his van. When man, that's a one big sticker on the back of that van you got right there. <laughs> so we started talking and we talked about being pastors together and then uh, talk and it's just it really was kind of a divine appointment in that I just said you know we next we're, we've got this group coming we're gonna be doing a mental health symposium would that be something that you would be interested in he said absolutely but we were in the planning stages at that point and it was and said well we meet every Wednesday at 1230 to start talking about what we're doing well 1230 in walks pastor bio with a couple cups of Starbucks coffee and we've been off and running since then so, so he's, been, he's become a good friend of mine uh, my name is Carl Whitehill. I pastor a church called the Father's House 
International. We're off of Bernal Road uh, in South San Jose. It's a community church, but I belong to very much, very similar to him, a Pentecostal holiness church tradition. Not that I fit that well with them, mind you, but that's just kind of where I've been planted, and that's where I sometimes bloom and I sometimes get criticized for. Some of the reasons I get criticized for is within our faith tradition, uh, it, it's, it's sometimes very difficult for um, pastors, for congregations and congregants to really deal with the issues that surround mental health. And I think it's because the stigma is always there, but sometimes just by the name Pentecostal and holiness tradition, there's a lot of baggage when you think about those two in and of themselves. And so to be able to come and say, I've got these problems that I need help with, and just my spiritual experience isn't dealing with it. Well, then that's where you begin to find that you can open up doors for people to simply say, well, maybe there's a better way to do that. That's combining spirituality and your spiritual, whatever your faith tradition is, and also with, uh, with, with dealing with uh, clinical care when needed and how needed. So we've kind of merged those two things together. Thank you. Okay, so since you have the mic past her, I'm going to challenge you. How did you get involved with FaithNet? Why did you get involved with FaithNet? And well, um, how is it kind yeah. of you making kind of mental health changes in the congregation? Yeah. Well, I got involved with FaithNet probably because of you to start with. <laughs> and I was doing an introduction at the church, and then she, she, she asked me to a meeting, uh, a luncheon that we had, which was, was several years ago now, probably six years. And uh, so we went to this and we just listened. And we, the Father's House was represented. We had, I don't know if you remember that, we had about five or six people. And so we were well represented. Although some of the people, are, my congregation, they were uncomfortable because there was many faith traditions there. Um, but for me, that wasn't something that bothered me because I felt like, you know, it, it, we, we all are after the same thing, really. And so that kind of started it. Then they started a weekly or monthly faith net luncheons where it was brown bag and bring your own food and so then we started going to that and we had a really good time but that's how I got involved but what kind of led me there was exactly kind of what Pastor Bio talked about and that was the idea that that uh, the stigma in the churches and with people is so great and needs to be tackled and that if I didn't speak up on behalf of my congregation and my denomination then who would and so I chose at that point to become more involved with it I'm not as professional as these guys. I don't have the credentials that they have, but I have a heart for it. And I think that it starts there and I can learn the rest. Thank you. Same question. All right. I think my, my case, I'm the same with Pastor Carl. And Pastor Carl became my link to Don, and Don became my link to FitNet. And when I met um, Pastor Cindy during the first program we had last year it became an issue for me that I became very passionate about it and being a pastor I've been working some of this mental institution the first question I asked myself what if this particular patient is my mother is my sister is my son my my daughter how am I gonna treat them <clears throat> that's back a kind of uh, empathy in me so every time I'm on the floor working with this client I treat them special as somebody who is part of me. I see them as a whole human being, not somebody with mental issue, but somebody that needs love and care. And that brings the connection between me and this particular organization. And I trust God that we are going to do much more uh, with Don and Pastor Cindy and the Fitna and Nami. And we're ready to see what we can bring to the table together. Thank you. FaithNet through Barbara. She's sitting back there. Um, she introduced me to the, um, the mental health community. I am 50 now, and I did not know about mental health until seven years ago. Um, I was a, 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 a research and development engineer for 20 years. We, we never talk about FaithNet. Uh, we never talk about mental health. Um, I completed my um, master in um, pastoral ministry again no mental health yeah so um so what struck me was when i started to do my um i started to get involved more with mental health barbara she basically dragged me everything she went everywhere she went and i start to get involved i start to see 
that is actually more common than 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 you know we are doing a very good job at hiding it. Um, so when I start to work with clients, because I'm completing my uh, my my doctor in in clinical psychology, so I I see clients, and uh, what struck me was that. Um, as an engineer, when things don't work, I just grab the whole thing and I rebuild, right? Yeah. I, I figured that I, and then what struck me was that I can't do the same with people. And, and that's when, that's when I, I come to realize that, that we have to be human being to, I'm not, to, 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 um, to my client. I have to be a human person to share this human experience with my client regardless of the process. It's the process that counts. So, and then go back to FaithNet, and um, basically I got invited to one of the luncheon, and then I saw all this faith community, you know, uh, uh, sitting together, talk about how we can talk about mental health, talk about the illnesses that people are experiencing. And I instantly got uh, attracted to it. I, I fell in love with it because I like the model that NAMI as well as men, um, the FaithNet is, um, is using is through education. Because I believe that through education, we learn to have, we have choices. We learn to have, we learn to have pauses, we learn to take pauses to understand our own experience, to understand our own fear. And then we, we are, we have enough tool to basically respond as opposed to react and hide. So that's the part where I, um, I hope that FaithNet continue on, you know, continue to work with different faith communities because I think um, that's, I, I think for me as a Catholic, the Catholic um, Church has a structure, has a structure where you actually, where we actually can, can, can somehow hopefully, hopefully with you know Barbara and Chris um, to continue to work. To basically in, uh, to be part of that structure, right? They have a structure where, where um, uh, uh, I'm just watching my time. <laughs> She's doing, that. yeah. So I, I think, I think you know, I get excited about this work, and I have been only here. I, I have only been introduced to this only seven years, and I know I have a lot to learn. I know I have a lot to learn with you know from my clients. And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I shared a little bit already how we got introduced with FaithNet, uh, just being on the board with Momentum and our partnerships. Um, I'll spend a little bit more time on why I felt we needed something in our own faith community there. I had um, been involved with Momentum, so I had been around mental health, never knew how it really affected me personally. I have been a musician in the church for 30 years and always felt like that was one of my ministries. Chip Ingram, who was the pastor at Venture there, was giving a message on your holy ambition. And at that moment, I felt like God really, you know, spoke to me and said, your holy ambition is now mental health. It realized, I realized where he had taken me in my journey, being on a board, serving those, you know, the Bible says, serving the least of these. God cares for them. He cares for the brokenhearted and that they too have a purpose to do his work. And so we started um, support groups there at Venture called Living with Hope and Mental Health. Our hope obviously being in Christ, you know, where do you turn to when you're hitting rock bottom? Where do you turn to when you're struggling? That's the faith part. That's where it comes back, and we always point people back to Jesus. I have a tremendous amount of um, incredible people I get to work with, some who have their own mental health journeys, who we have about 20 volunteers in our support group. Um, they are core leaders, and then there's support volunteers. Actually, two of them are here, Michelle and Helen. Um, and so while I facilitate the ministry, they're really the ones that are ministering to the people or who are showing up to these support groups. We offer men's, women's, and then a family support group for loved ones, either spouses or children who are struggling. And like I said, the kind of divine appointment of the people that God has put in place for those um, support groups is pretty incredible. And so just 
you know, like you said, is having the heart for it, having no degree, but because I care for people, um, wanted to be the voice, like I said, for the people who sometimes don't have the voice, who pull away, who feel alone. Um, and, and part of that is through partnerships. You know, we're all in God's church. And so, well, you know, individually, we can really affect, you know, people one on one, but collectively, we can really affect a community. And I love the fact that we're all here and have such a strong um, faith community presence in mental health right here in our own community. So we have a couple more, qu I mean, a couple more minutes. And, um, and really, the question that I have is, you know, what have been some of your successes and challenges? But we can only get one person to answer the question. We really only have a couple minutes, and then we're gonna open it up to the audience and where you all can ask a questions. We have about 15 minutes. Oh, we have 30. Oh, fantastic. So we have until 8.30. Okay. Successes, anyone? Oh, okay. Um, so one of the challenges for us is that we partnered with Saddleback down in Southern California. Pastor Rick Warren and his wife have their own mental health journey. Um, they had already started support groups, and so they explained it as kind of three things, kind of the crawl, the walk, and the run step. And so we thought, okay, we're going to crawl into this mental health thing, kind of bring education and awareness to our congregation. Well, the need was so huge. Um, with a congregation the size of 3,500 to 4,000 members, the statistics say that there's a good large amount of people sitting right in our own congregation that need help. And so the 20 of us, you know, really trying to get up to speed as fast as possible. And so that was really a challenge. Um, I think some of our success has been in the people who have the courage to actually show up. Right. I'm constantly reminding them that it's not about the numbers. It's not about how many people actually come to our support group, but it's about how we can touch and support and to journey alongside each individual that shows up and show them through God's love by us being the hands and feet of Jesus that they do have a purpose. Our kind of ministry verse is 2 Corinthians 1 verses 3 through 5 where it talks about how we go through hardships where God comforts us so then we in return can then comfort those who are going through the same thing we did just like God did for us. And so we really try to emphasize that as the purpose of their life. Amen. Hi. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, I just started seven years ago, and I fell in love with the mental health community. And so I, um, we as a group with the Barbara back there, and uh, so we try to bring uh, resources from the county to 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 to, the, to most holy Trinity Parish. Um, so far, what we have done together with FaithNet and with the um, the, uh, the Mental Health Ministry Network at the Diocese of San Jose, we um, we had a parent um, parent meeting of 50 parents, um, and then we also did a um, let me see I wrote it down here, and then we also did um, Cindy uh, did a. Um, a Talk to had a meeting with the staff at most of Trinity Parish, and then we also had a meeting with the deanery, um, with six parishes uh, were there, and then we also um, have um, the mental health ministry network, um, not the mental health ministry, the uh, what do you call it, the first aid training, the mental health first aid training. We actually um, invited. Um, the, the trainer from the county to to Mosul Trinity Parish and um, to have the training there with the staff and um, I'm hoping to um, to talk to the parish to, to the pastor there to um, to install a satellite office there so that way the therapist can go there to see the client without so they probably feel more comfortable there especially they know that it's actually um, been approved by the um, by the pastor so we are hoping to get that's the next step that we are hoping to do thank you yeah thank you so much um one of the successes we had was after we had the conference with um, don brown pastor carl and 
a last step. Pastor Cindy was there. That sparks up something in, on the inside of me. And one of the things that sparked up inside of me was that I came to realize that nothing happened by accident. And one of the things I realized was that in the Bible, the Bible says after Ruth left a, a country and went with Naomi, and she was staying with Naomi, her mother-in-law. And the Bible said, Naomi told her, you need to go to the feed, clean with the other women. And the Bible says, Ruth happened by chance to stumble into the feed of Boaz. She could have gone to other people's field. Why would God bring her to Boaz's feed? Boaz was the next king man. Somebody else could have seen me. A lot of people saw me at Costco. Nobody introduced me to this particular mental health pastor. <laughs> Carl saw me and said, let's talk about mental health. And I asked myself, how come my first job was in the mental health industry? Every time I tried to get another job, I found myself back into the mental health. So that creates something in me that God is leading me to do something. And ever since we started trying to, as a church, begin to talk about it. Because it's one of the things we don't talk about in the African community. I saw some of my members in our church that came to the conference. It sparks up a fire in them. And right now we are putting up a conference in September this year. Uh, to be able to talk and address mental health issues. That's number one. Number two, we found that, that in the African community, every especially among young people, teenagers, statistics shows that the rate of mental health is high now among the um, college student, postgraduate student, especially those who are doing their masters and PhDs. And I found that why is it? Because because they want to succeed. Everybody wants to succeed by all means. So this is what we are trying to do to create an awareness more that you don't need to be pressured. Success is something that is going to happen, but you have to take it one day at a time. Otherwise, you are going to break down. And one of the things that God has given us for the conference is creating a mental conference that we call Sound Mind. We want to bring people to the place where that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Thank you. I think when you're referring to your conference, you're referring to your denomination, right? Yeah. So, so you, it's almost more reaching out even to your denomination to kind of bring it up. But yeah, interesting. You know, I'm listening to people talk and thinking about the, the father's house journey and mental illness. It started years ago, but I won't go into that with a with a woman that uh, a good friend of mine, 26 years old, had paranoid schizophrenia, which really started when I was a young pastor, a very young in that day, in those days. I actually didn't have gray hair and a bald spot, but. That was long ago, but that that kind of first started it. But I think the journey of the Father's House for us, my wife and I, and for the congregation is when we came into the church, it had been a fragmented church, and really for all practical purposes was dead. We kind of really revived it. Um, but one of the places that we came to as the Father's House was what our vision statement is today, and it's uh, love's arms open wide, welcome home. And something's happened to me in my journey throughout the years that I began to I began to realize that all of us are searching for wholeness, whether we're Roman Catholic, whether we're Christian, whether we're Buddhist, Hindu, Muslims, uh, any other faith tradition, and or even atheists, whoever you would want to count. So the idea for us was to live that model, to just simply say, we want everybody to come here and we want everybody to be welcome. So what we don't do is we don't belittle other faith traditions to make ours look better. Also from the pulpit, some of the things that we do is we watch what we say and how we say it. So we don't necessarily talk about demon possession. And we don't have to badmouth anybody else to make ourselves look good. So it changes kind of the dynamics. So within our faith tradition, uh, or in our church, I think that whether you're a part of the LGBT community, whether you're suffering from mental illness, whether you're about another faith tradition, or you're an atheist, and we have all of them in our congregation, we can simply begin to work from that touchstone and begin to work forward. So with that, some of the ways we work forward is, number one, our pulpit presentation on what we say and what we don't say, um, and how we say what we say. Another thing is, is we try to incorporate different types of classes in that really help people. So we use a couple of different ones right now. We've got, uh, we've got an AA class that means that you can say, well, does that, how, what's that have to do with mental health? But many of us would know that mental health and addiction many times go hand in hand. So we have, we have an AA meeting. We also run a class called Celebrate Recovery, which was from the Saddleback community as well. And so we run a, a Celebrate Recovery, which deals with hurts, hangups, and habits 
which is open to other groups. We also there's another group by, by the uh, by uh, the guy's name is Peter Skezero, which is out of New York, which is called Emotional Healthy Spirituality. And what that is is the premise that you can't be spiritually mature unless you're emotionally healthy. And so the idea is they're mutually exclusive. So to be able to bring together and bind together really the idea of mental health, stability, and spirituality, those two things have to intersect in a way where you realize you can't be spiritually mature and not deal with your mental illness. They're just mutually exclusive. And then the other one that we're looking at bringing into would be the, the whole uh, one on hope, which will be the next one that we're that we're wanting to launch. The problem is being a smaller church is uh, as, as a as a pastor. Pastor Bio has even more than I, I have a problem with, and that's spinning the plates. You can only spin so many plates, and so we've got other people taking the other classes. But my wife is now going to be teaching an emotionally healthy women's class starting in June first or the first week of June, I should say, on a Thursday, to always keep some program there so that people can come and get involved. And we don't care who you are, what part of the what community you're from, what your faith, trends, your faith tradition is, or anything else, because it's not our job to tell people what to think or what to believe. It's for us to be there to provide information and let those people think for themselves. So that's kind of where we are as a congregation. Thank you. Okay. Let's give them all a round of applause. All right. So now we're going to open up um, the floor for questions. Raise your hand and I'll run down and give you the mic. Okay. We'll start here in the front. This is for Jason. The support groups, are they open to people who aren't regular attenders of your church? Good question. Yes, they are. Like, um, I'm sorry, Pastor on the end, Carl, um, said, they're open to anyone. Um, eventually, and that was one of the points that I was hoping we were going to get to as to what's next for us, is we started with our congregation because that was the captive audience to kind of get us going and up to speed. My crawl, walk, run analogy, we found ourselves not crawling barely even walking, but really running because the demand was so huge. And so now that we kind of got, we started our second year this year under our belt, we're looking to expand it, but anyone is welcome to come. So the support groups, um, we do have it on our church's website. Um, it's under our ministry section there, support ministry. It's the first and third Monday of the month, um, and they are support groups. And so that's one thing that we really you know, tell people is that it's in, not in, you know, taking the place of doctor visits, not prescribing medication, it's additional support, um, not therapy groups or anything like that. And so, yeah, it's open to anyone. Any other questions? My question is, how do you train the leaders of the groups, either for Jason or Carl? We use, and I'll pass it to you, Pastor Carl, um, we use Saddleback um, training model for our volunteers. And then there's a church out of Texas called Grace Alliance who has a wonderful um, curriculum that actually gives us some of our um, tangible tools that we can send with people as they leave. So um, training, you know, we're one that says don't reinvent the wheel. If there are churches out there doing things way ahead of us, let's adopt their model. We tweak it to make it fit our church specifically, um, but that's what we used. Yeah, yeah and this is, the, this is the program here that he's referring to. Uh, and you can get this on Saddleback's website. And it's a great, it's, it's some great material, and that's something that in our future that, that we'll be implementing more, kind of there, they're kind of there, we've kind of taken a different approach to it. Uh, training's always an interesting thing, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's interesting because we come with so many different perspectives, and we come with so many different paradigms of what we think and how we think ought to be. That training isn't a one-time, let's go through a class for six weeks and train. What you find is it really comes down to a day by day or week by week, month by month mentoring. Not that, not that you don't give them the basic material, but you realize that they're not necessarily where you are in your faith journey or in your understanding and knowledge of them. So what happens is, is you can give them those programs and give them the guidelines, which all of these, whether it would be the Hope or the Celebrate Recovery would have different guidelines on how to run a meeting and also what to expect and what to do, et cetera, et cetera, all those different kind of things. 
but the real challenge becomes in being able to tease out of people those things that they need and those things that will change their life. And so it's the idea of taking your group leaders and your people and helping them begin to tease out of people those things. Because that's when the interaction, that's when life really get changed. Right? They don't get changed with one person talking. They get changed when the room's talking and they're experiencing and sharing with one another. Uh, like for instance, just to, with Jason sharing about this church in Texas, you know, being looking at a franchise is never a bad thing to see what you can pick up by way of a gem that you can use. So thank you very much. Thanks. Um, my question actually was about volunteers as well and your, your core team um, members. So do you go through a process in selecting those members? What, what is your process in bringing people together to lead teams? Both uh, everybody and anybody, yeah. And I had one more thing after that. Thank you. So for, for, for me in our church, one of the things we try to do is to make sure that all the leaders that we are trying to bring in this um, team are people, number one, who can, who can vouch to their uh, potentials. They have the human heart to love, number two, confidentiality. Number three, we are able to bring them to the point whereby we let them know that this is a ministry trying to bring people from whatever state they are broken to the place of wholeness and we give them training we try to educate them and this is one of the curriculum we're trying to use from the hope uh, uh, curriculum from Saduback. and we go through all this thing making sure that every leader in the dream were well trained and then you can actually recognize when you begin to see those symptoms in people because sometimes they don't tell you, oh, I'm having mental issue, but from behavior, from the way they talk, you can, okay, this person have a, an issue, and we can quickly step in and see how we can help. I didn't know if any, okay. And just, this is a shameless advertisement, um, but the Mental Health Ministry Network of the Diocese of San Jose is sponsoring the movie Angst tomorrow. It is free, it's a presentation in high school from 7 a.m. until 9, 7 p.m. until 9 p.m. And uh, there will be a panel of five who will be presenting. So angst is about anxiety and depression uh, in youth and young adults. And uh, there's quite a, and there's also a great panel discussion following that. Rich Berryessa was, was part of putting that together. So just one free presentation high school. Thank you. Wow, sounds good. Well, the movie was great. I just saw it last week. So if you do get a chance, go see it. Good evening. So I, for the last two years, I've been involved with um, the IPAC, Interagency Prevention Advisory Council in Sacramento, statewide um, agency, or not agency, but statewide effort uh, across agencies, numerous agencies in the state uh, government. And I uh, sit on the Suicide Prevention um, uh, work group uh, for uh, that suicide and depression work group. And one of the things that we have been exploring is how to get messages out across the state uh, to faith communities. Uh, I know certain faith communities, you know, have a structure, my own tradition, uh, Roman Catholicism, you know, has a, has a clear structure through diocese and archdiocese to disseminate information. But I'm really wondering if you have any um, thoughts or, or suggestions on how to disseminate information beyond your own, you know, congregation um, at a regional or even statewide level. All right, um, before we take the next question, one of the things uh, we are trying to do in our church right now, for instance, the organization I belong to, right now in the United States, we have about uh, 1,200 local assemblies spread across both in the West Coast and the East Coast. And here in, um, in Northern California alone, we have over 20 churches. So one of the things we do is that we normally have a kind of annual uh, monthly zona meetings of the pastors during the meetings, we pass across this information. We are trying to uh, make sure other faith leaders, pastors in our community are able to know these and we are able to spread the word from San Jose to Sacramento to Vallejo to Fairfield. And we want to make sure that everybody come on board. And also we use our website, Facebook, and to be able to pass across some of this thing. And I'm glad what you mentioned about this, especially the issue of the suicide prevention. And I just had an incident about two days ago. My daughter was just telling me one of the 
um, student in the school <clears throat> and the grade was going down and he was in the uh, football club. The mother wanted him to do well, but he found out that his grade was going down and suddenly the mother realized he was in the room and he didn't come out on time. And the mother was like, okay, he doesn't stay in the room longer than one hour. They realized the boy has been inside for over two, three hours. The mother called the friend. By the time they came out, uh, the friend came down, they have to break the door open and discover that the boy had actually overdosed and he was going to commit suicide. And how do we stop all these things? So those information are very important. What you guys are doing is very important. And I think as faith leaders and uh, faith um, network of leaders, we need to network together to be able to see what do we need to put in place to stop all this thing from happening in our community. I don't know if Jason or Pastor Carl has something to say about that. For us, I mean, we don't have kind of a structure like the diocese. Um, however, what I would suggest is right now, teens are, you know, particularly susceptible to this, the pressure around here. Um, there's a lot of youth organizations um, through the Christian and um, other faith community denominations that are out there. Um, you know, I'm thinking of Christ, Christ in Youth programs. There's um, Campus Crusades. I would maybe start to attack some of those and see if you might be able to get the word out there. Um, that's one of the challenges, right, is that, you know, getting the word out, what we've found just for our community to be really beneficial is when it comes from the senior pastor. When it's coming from the pulpit, um, that is really where it's most effective. And so, um, like um, Kathy mentioned or Cindy mentioned, that Venture is honoring May as Mental Health Awareness Month. So we have a table in our lobby. The pastor is speaking on it. They're showing videos. We have another one coming up this coming week. And so if you can get the faith leaders of these congregations on board or attend any local seminars, that's probably your best bet in our world. Okay. Uh, Before we go there, is, yeah, uh, hold on one second, yeah, sir. Thank you. Sorry, just for one second. Um, uh, Chris, oh, good to see you again, Chris. By the way, um, I, I wanted to mention that the one thing that I've that I've seen here is, in, and I appreciate the the idea that it comes from the senior pastor. And this, whatever the senior pastor supports, that's the direction the church is either going to go or the senior pastor will be gone if he made the wrong call. That's just the way it works. Um, but I want to address also the idea of thinking about how I got here through Don. And Pastor Bio got here through me, and how we met Cindy, and how we met Barbara, and how we've all done this has been really through this this powerful networking uh, tool that we have by our relationships. Looking at church is the way that a church grows. A church grows if you could look at church growth statistics. Seventy-eight to somewhere about eighty-five percent of all churches grow not by outside evangelism but by personal relationships of friends and families so the idea for us to grow a faith net and for us to grow this or to grow it within the diocese is to get the support per se of the leaders but at the other side realizing the power of who you are to network with others and bring it see the community of Jesus Christ or any faith community the, let's, let's call it the community of God ultimately works through relationships and that's relationships really where we have our power power isn't in me as a senior pastor dictating to anybody anything the power is when we do it together and we're all going that same direction so thank you okay uh, so my name is Wes Mokoyama and I'm on the Behavioral Health Board and uh, I wrote this proposal five years ago uh, in 2014 for re uh, faith-based training. And finally, I'm very proud to say that uh, NAMI has, has gotten the contract for that, which will start in July. And soon Dawn will be uh, some of the people reaching out to all the faith-based leaders and the idea of it is to penetrate these communities and who will go who will they go first to if they are having mental health problems they'll go to their their church their synagogue their temple and you guys are wonderful examples and thank you so much for for your uh presentations uh, Reverend Carl, i like your reaching out to all faiths and i think that that, that is important we hope that this can spread it out even further and reach out to all these faith-based groups. And uh, just very proud that 
say that this will be happening uh, starting in July, right? And they just signed the contract, I understand. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so if this I, is a I, perfect we'll say, segue, say Wes, no more. They, because uh, almost all of you know that NAMI has received its single largest grant, a half a million dollars from the uh, county, and uh, it's an innovation grant to do exactly this kind of work. Um, so, yay us. <laughs> Um, we are tasked with particularly working with uh, faith communities in five ethnic communities, although not exclusively. Yes, so we are open uh, beyond that, but we are asked to work in the African American, Latino, Filipino, Chinese, and Vietnamese communities. So one of the things that you can do to help us is if you know of faith leaders be they uh, ordained or lay in, in those ethnic groups. We have started by having focus groups, but we are gonna be doing more work uh, to grow our, our relationships, as, as Carl said. One of the things I really want to point out, obviously churches are human organizations, synagogues are human organizations, any religious body is a human organization, and so stigma, stigma is there. The other thing that we're up against in faith communities is for those of us who have uh, gone to seminary, what we are very much taught is a medical model. And we are not taught a model of wellness and recovery. And so part of the education that we're doing with, with faith leaders is to get out of this model of, hey, I see this person in the pews, they're having problems, I'll escort them to where they can get help, but that's it. And, and instead of, I'll, I'll escort them, the community will go with them, and we're gonna be here when you come back from whatever treatment that, that you need. And, and part of, Anna has been um, very much an active proponent of building a bridge between faith leaders, between uh, spiritual directors, and people who are doing the clinical work. And part of the grant that we've received is to work with behavioral health staff to teach them how to use spirituality and religion in the care that they're giving to people. Because frankly, we're talking about people in behavioral health who are afraid of spirituality, and we're talking about people in the spiritual world who are afraid of mental health. And so we are trying to, to build that, that bridge. Uh, Wes, yeah. Yes, the professional community also needs training. And, and in the end, it, it doesn't matter what faith language we speak, we're, we are all about the same thing. And, and many of you have heard this quote from um, Stephen Pocklington. Uh, Henry, you know this well. Human beings aren't problems to be solved, they're mysteries to be honored. And that is what we are about, is to honor the mystery of every single person. I don't care what diagnosis they have, where they fall in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Illnesses, who cares? Human beings are not problems to be solved, they're mysteries to be honored. So thank you for all the ways that you are honoring the mysteries uh, all around us. And thank you for all the ways that you're gonna support us going forward with this grant for the next two years. And thank you to Jason, Anna, Pastor Bio, and Pastor Carl for being with us tonight. I think uh, they'll be, they will be around if you wanna speak with them. Um, I do wanna celebrate, Anna is finished up her dissertation. Woo! Woo! And her dissertation is on integrating faith and spirituality in therapy, in psychotherapy. So talk to her about that among all these other things. <laughs>